I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for November 14th, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum on the committee. Ms. Chike Kalu. Present. Ms. Dominowski. Here. Ms. Pumphrey. Present. Dr. Savoy. Ms. Delotsky. Present. Ms. Lichter. Present. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato. Present. Dr. Kraft. Present. Ms. Fisher. Present. Ms. Weaver. Pres <clears throat> Present. Ms. Wicks. Present. Ms. Machinda. Present. Ms. Greenberg. That's it. Thank you. And is there anybody on the meeting that we did not mention that we want to take note of? Thank you. Um, our first item on today's agenda is uh, new business, and our first presentation will be on the elementary computer science and innovation books. And we have Dr. Kraft, Ms. Fisher, and Ms. Weaver. Thank you so very much. We're excited to talk a little bit about our elementary computer science uh, program and also the curriculum titles that will be going on display uh, after the meeting today. Uh, so I will turn it over uh, to uh, Ms. Fisher uh, and Ms. Weaver at this point. Hello, thank you. Um, so elementary computer science and innovation is a program that uh, is been in our schools since 2019, and this year it's grown to 30 schools um, as of September 2024. Um, the elementary computer science innovation curriculum addresses computer science standards uh, K through five, and it really builds on some important skills that students can develop uh, that really align for them to be supported then as they transition to programs in middle school and then hopefully in the future in high school. Um, this really came out of a need for both to make sure that we're working towards meeting the state goal of making sure that students have access to K-12 computer science uh, once um, I think the goal is 2031. And so this was one of the ways to work with that, as well as to build it in as a special area for our, for our students in all of our schools um, as we start to look forward at how do we meet their needs as we go forward. So as um, part of the curriculum, we really look at literacy and we really look at how do we build both their computer literacy, you know, their media literacy, but also, um, you know, there's so many great resources and ways to connect with children through literature. And there's some incredible pieces of literature that we're able to bring into our program. So the pieces, the, the books that we're bringing forward here are were selected in alignment with um, the BCPS selection policy and guidelines 6002, um, as well as in connection with and relationship to our library media collections. And so these are really looking at the research that's around computational thinking in children's literature and what are some of the pieces from that, as well as the making sure they're aligned to standards. And then the evaluation process was through the CNI curriculum specialist, as well as the curriculum writers who are elementary computer science teachers. Um, important attention was paid to the age appropriate um, you know, in terms of length, content, and vocabulary, as well as making sure we really represent diversity um, with the authors as well. Um, and these um, were all of the, then all of the curriculum was, all of these resources were available during our, our curriculum writing for advisors to review. So they've been available for many situations. Um, and so then um, looking at some of the resources, and I'm going to probably bring in Ms. Weaver here to tell us a little bit more about some of these. What we're really thinking about these resources, looking at K-2 uh, titles, these are some of the 
the themes that we're really looking at. And so, you know, this is ways to help students to better understand things like algorithms and programming, computing systems, data analysis, and networking and internet impacts on computing. So, Ms. Weaver, if there's anything else you wanted to add specifically to the K-2 to or K-2 to titles. Uh, just basically the general understanding that the computer science standards are broken down into these five sub uh, components uh, that Ms. Fisher said, the algorithms and programming, computer sys computing systems, data analysis, networks and the internet and impacts and computing. And then the standards are, there are one for each grade level, but we also kind of look at them in bands. So these are the K2 bands. And then we also have the same five sub concepts in the three to five bands. And so these are the books that we're looking at here. And so you might notice we've got some of the, there's some recurring characters in some of these texts. Uh, so that really is a way for students to kind of um, get and stay engaged as they start to learn more about computer science. If we have any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, if there are questions from board members, we can um, get them answered now. Okay, um, seeing none. Um, was this item up for vote or was this just an update? It was just informational okay. uh, to let you know that we're about to put them on display. Although uh, Ms. Fisher talked about, we've had them several places, but we are going to put a public notice out that uh, anyone can review them. Um, so at this point, it is just informational. We actually already have a contract to purchase the books, but we also want to make sure that everybody is aware of the books that are being added into the curriculum. Thank you. And um, I see that Ms. Dominowski has a question. Absolutely. Sorry, just one since you, you brought that up. You said you already um, had them available somewhere. I was looking for them. Are, are they still available oh. or are they... No, no, no. They they're getting ready. So the before it goes on public notice, we do take it to the curriculum committee first, and so they are working on um, putting it up. And so we will, um, when they tell me that the public notice has officially gone up, we will actually drop the books off um, at Greenwood Building E. So um, we're hoping that's going to happen in the next few days. Will there be any like um, samples that anyone would be able to view online if they're not able to go to Greenwood? Just like. You know. We can we can see. I am happy to look and see if any of them. They probably wouldn't be the whole book, but um, several right. of those books might have excerpts. Um, and we okay. certainly could. That. Thank you for um asking that. I can definitely look into that. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Miss Pumphrey. You had your hand up. Oh, sorry. My question was about posting online, and uh, Miss Dominowski already asked, and the question was answered. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I just have one quick question. Um, would the um, items be available at Tuesday's board meeting? Just um, predicting questions from parents and families. Uh, that's the goal is that they will be um, available, that the public notice will be released and that the uh, books will be available at that point. So um, we really do try to coincide it with a board meeting so that knowing that people are coming, um, that they're available um, to see. Okay, thank you. Of course. Um, are there any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, um, thank you for the update. Um, our next item is an update on the secondary ELA pilot. And for that, we call on Dr. Kraft and Ms. Wicks. So thank you so much. Uh, we are really excited to give you a little bit of an update on uh, what is happening um, with the secondary curriculum pilot. And it was uh, super exciting because we were with principals today and we got to hear from principals about what is working. So you're going to hear a little bit from Ms. Wicks about, you know, how we've been supporting what's been going on. And then we actually have feedback from today from the principals about real time how it's going in the building. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Wicks at this point. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kraft. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having us. So as you know, as um, at the start of quarter two, all schools transitioned to piloting my perspectives in grades six through 12. And so as uh, in light of that, we wanted to start by sharing the, some of the supports that we've 
be provided to schools, both those who transitioned to my perspectives, as well as those who began the year with my perspectives. So on the screen, you can see um, our office has assigned an instructional specialist to each school to provide direct support um, for the admin team, as well as the teachers. We we also developed a partnership where each DC has a mentor buddy. So the schools that started the year with my perspectives, those DCs have buddied up with a school that has transitioned to my perspectives, and those DCs are working together to support one another. Um, over the course of this academic year, we provided specific professional learning for distinct audiences. So to principals, assistant principals, and staff development teachers. And we'll talk a little more about what else is to come. And then to further assist in that transition based both on what we know about the schools who are coming new to My Perspectives and based on feedback we received from schools who started with My Perspectives, our office developed two weeks of very well fleshed out lesson plans for every grade level to really give teachers an on-ramp in um, starting the second quarter. And you'll get to see a sample of that in a moment. If you would click the slide, um, click again, there we go, it should come up. The next box, there we go. And so here we just wanted to provide a little bit of some specificity around some of the support we provided. So for the entire month of October, our office has offered curriculum drop-in sessions, and those are open to any teachers or administrators. They've been offered twice weekly, one session during the school day, and one session as a paid after-school offering each week. So far for October, we've had a total of 74 teachers who've attended with an average of about seven attendees per session coming for curriculum and planning support. We will continue those throughout the academic year, but we wanted to give you that snapshot. On October 22nd, we met with our department chairs for professional learning, and we were able to have the vendor of My Perspectives come to really give them um, differentiated training. So we had them divided into two cohorts, those who had started the year with My Perspective versus those who were just transitioning, so that they could really be well positioned to support their teams on our November 1st Professional Development Day. And so that's the last piece you see there on the screen. Um, on November 1st, the System-Wide Professional Development Day, we did have our vendor come for all teachers. We even had our special educators participate so that um, for the classes they are co-teaching for ELA, that they would be supported. We had a total of 402 teachers who attended, and the day was split. We had AM, our differentiated vendor training, again, for those just transitioning versus those who had been there for a while. And then the afternoon, um, teachers were able to work with their department chairs in school teams to do some planning with on-site support from both the vendor as well as members of our content office. Next slide, please. Here you can see just a snippet of the sample lesson plans that we provided for the first two weeks of the second quarter. And what you'll see with the highlights are some additions that we've made to really help support teachers, both in the immediate and in the long term, to give them some guidance about how they should really move forward in their own lesson planning. And so what you'll see in black is really all the pieces that My Perspectives pro um, provides that we've pulled together in one document to show teachers how they can go about making a simplified lesson plan. Plan. And then all the different highlights are what I have bulleted there on the left. And so we've highlighted in yellow um, as in our partnership with the Office of Advanced Academics, where we've put additions into each of those lesson plans of best practices to support our GT students. We also have highlighted in kind of that orangey color there um, where we've added additions of engagement strategies for all students. So really trying to model for teachers how they can take what's in the curriculum, still deliver it with integrity and add that art of teaching. So in, if the um, curriculum just says students will complete a written response, what other ways might they be um, able to demonstrate their mastery? So we've got suggestions for example, of a Socratic seminar, class discussion, a um, philosophical chair, so different engagement strategies to help support engagement um, for students and teachers. And then in blue, we have highlighted some instructional steps within the lesson plans that were really informed by the research for better teaching that BCPS is engaged in. So for example, really focusing on what parts of the lesson plan emphasize clarity and high expectations. One example would be how to unpack the standards and the objectives for each lesson. So that's just a sample of what we've provided for teachers. Next slide. 
So at the end of quarter one, we began collecting our initial feedback. Um, we partnered with DRAA, the Office of uh, the Department of Research Assessment and Accountability, and they helped us to develop um, a feedback form to collect the most effective feedback that we possibly could based on the criteria in our rubric. So uh, we just wanted to share a small sample of some of the feedback that we collected. And again, it's just the initial feedback at the end of quarter one from the schools who were originally participating. We had um, a response from 120 teachers. And one of the questions we asked was surrounding um, the idea of um, their thoughts on the curriculum elements. For each of the areas, teachers could rank them from strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. And so for some of the highest ranked elements in this specific category, teachers ranked highly that um, the curriculum provided complex, interesting texts, as well as challenging assignments. Those were the two highest ranked. In terms of curriculum elements, that were the lowest ranked or that received the highest number of respondents saying they disagreed or strongly disagreed, it was around the idea of engaging activities and clear instruction on new skills. Um, I'm going to share some more feedback, but I do want to share that all of that feedback is going to help inform the professional development that we provide both from our office and with the vendor. Um, next slide, we'll give a little more feedback. Some additional initial feedback um, surrounded the area of sample resources and planning. Um, the survey provided statements in that area about what teachers felt they were seeing and receiving in the curriculum. Um, from all the statements that were listed, the two that ranked the most highest were teachers felt that they could plan responsibly with the curriculum, and they felt they were able to plan lessons and activities that provided variety and options for student work and expression. The two that scored the lowest were that um, teachers felt there were effective resources for supporting students receiving accommodations and online resources are to think in most of those lowest ranked responses revolve around the idea that my perspectives um, provides so many resources. And so part of our work is helping teachers figure out how to sort them and use them most effectively. So we appreciate that feedback. And then one more slide for a little more initial feedback. And so another category was about the implementation and student interaction that teachers were seeing with the product. And so the two highest ranked from a slew of statements, um, my students are learning from the product, which of course is what we all want. So we were very excited to see that, that they agreed or strongly agreed, and that I can effectively implement reading and writing instruction using the curriculum. Those were actually two separate statements. One, I can effectively implement writing instruction and I can effectively implement reading instruction. And they tied actually as both being the second highest rated. Um, and then the two lowest ranked that provide us some great feedback, I can effectively provide grades and feedback on student work and my students are challenged at the appropriate level. Here I know there's some PD to do around the rubrics that are provided in my perspectives, as well as how to use those feedback features. Um, let me see. I, so I want to share here, just um, as Dr. Kraft mentioned, some of the pieces that were shared verbally in the principal leadership meeting today. So it was perfect timing. We were excited to be able to hear from two principals. They were actually sharing with their peers what their experiences have been in implementing my perspectives for all of the first quarter. And so I did write down a couple of their direct quotes. Um, and so we had a middle school principal who shared and a high school principal who shared. Our middle school principal shared um, that reteach and practice practice assignments are very clear and well aligned to the standards. And she, heard, she has heard her teachers saying that they like the um, plethora of built-in resources. Our high school principal shared that she hears teachers saying the unit activities, if you do them, set students up for success on the end of unit assessment, and that teachers are seeing that clear connection throughout. And um, she uh, shared some praise of that there are lots of sample essays to support both student growth and teacher scoring of writing. So we were very excited that not only were we able to hear directly from principals, but that other principals were able to hear directly from them. Next slide, please. And so we wanted to share, in addition to what 
has happened, what the ongoing and upcoming opportunities are for professional learning and the support that we'll be providing for schools. So our office will continue throughout the academic year, our biweekly drop-in curriculum support and planning support sessions for teachers and administrators. Those are open to everyone. And again, we offer sessions during the school day and after school to try to meet teachers where they're, it's most convenient. We will be offering, um, continuing in our monthly department chair meetings, the professional learning around how to use my perspectives and how to best maximize its resources. That will be facilitated both by members of our office and the vendor. Um, we will have quarterly coaching sessions for teachers that are going to be vendor facilitated. And we just got approval today that we're also going to have some drop-in coaching sessions for administrators that will be vendor facilitated. And so that hadn't been approved by the time we made the slide. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're also going to have um, on-demand individual school and teacher support. And so as we go out to schools, um, seeing what are the individual and specific needs of teachers and leadership teams at schools, that's going to help determine additional support that we will provide throughout the year. Um, next slide, please. And so as we continue our pilot Im implementation, our next steps are, as you see on the screen, our goal is to really expand our feedback loop. As I said earlier, so far we've had one survey that was shared um, with teachers based on their use at the end of the first quarter. That's gonna be expanded now district-wide, not only to teachers, but also to students. We're also gonna be having some in-person targeted focus groups where we can get that face-to-face -face feedback where oftentimes people feel much more free to share. That will include teachers, administrators, students, our student member of the board. We're very excited to get some feedback as well, um, as, as well as some community groups who have been involved in looking at some of the feedback. And then of course, we will be continuing our classroom observations. And so what is it that we're seeing in terms of successes and areas of growth or need for professional development as we visit schools across the county? We'll continue our professional learning opportunities, and those will be responsive based on the feedback and the observations we're getting. And that will continue to be differentiated, not only by schools um, determined by when they started my perspectives, but also based on what courses they're teaching, right? So um, differentiated PD for teachers who are um, teaching high numbers of students who are multilingual learners or who are receiving special education services or who are receiving services for advanced academics. And then our goal is to make a recommendation to the board in spring of 2025. So when we are able to evaluate all of the data, both from our HMH into reading pilot that was facilitated last year and our current pilot of my perspectives to be able to come to the board with a recommendation for which program we will facilitate countywide and extend a contract to. Next slide, please. And thank you so much for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Wicks. Are there board members with comments or questions? Okay, Ms. Dominowski. Ms. Pumphrey can go first this time if she wants. Oh, oh did I miss her? I'm sorry. Yes, Ms. Okay. Humphrey. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Well, really one question um, regarding two of the lowest ratings, which were the effective resources for supporting students receiving accommodations and um, students are challenged at the appropriate level. Um, what how are we addressing those two lower um, those two lower ratings? Those seem to stick out to me as something that's important. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, our focus is really around professional development because what we know in our content office is that those resources do exist within my perspectives. And it's really a question of our teachers having a difficult time finding them and or knowing how to use them. That was one of the things that attracted us when we did that initial rubric um, and that 6002 process um, that attracted us to my perspectives is it really does have quite a lot to support multilingual learners, students receiving special education services, students needing so additional support who are striving readers. And so what we're hearing is that that's really a case of teachers not knowing where or how to find them or how to use them effectively as they get used to the new program. Did I answer Okay, and as far as being challenged at the appropriate level, do you, yes. oh, um, did we know if that was more that they were um, you know, not enough challenge or not, uh, too the much opposite. challenge? 
It's the opposite. Yeah. What we've been hearing is some of our teachers um, feel that some of the coursework is a little too challenging for students. And again, I really, our thought is, um, again, that's a PD issue, um, really seeing what is it that they are struggling with and what are the expectations they have of the students. Because again, what we know is that My Perspectives is written at the level of rigor of the standards. And based on our data, what we also know is some teachers have not been teaching to that level. And so it's really a shift in here's where we should be targeting our instruction versus where have we been targeting our instruction. So again, professional development on how do we have the high and appropriate expectations for our students and how do we use the scaffolds that are necessary to get students where they need to be that's what i wanted to hear thank you sure thank you for the question thank you miss pumphrey um next miss dominowski yes thank you um so you said there were about 74 teachers who had come to the um the offered training i think it was early on the uh, extra trainings Yes, yeah, so those are the bi-weekly, the bi-weekly drop-in sessions for the month of October when we added up all the sessions and how many people had attended thus far, we had 74 participants thus far. And there they were 74 like individual, not repeat, none repeating. Um, there were some repeating. That's a great question. There were a few repeating. If we factored in the non-repeaters, let me just look really quickly, 66 individuals and then the total 74. Okay. And that would be out of 120 teachers or more than that? That would be more than that. So um, for the first quarter, we had, and let me just look at my data, for the first quarter, um, we had 26 schools who were participating in My Perspectives, which is a total of 268 teachers who were participating for the first quarter. So we offer, we advertise, we continue to encourage, we share with our um, department chairs and our principal leaders, um, and then we hope people come. I'm sure some of them are not coming because they're doing well, right? They're rocking and rolling with the program. They don't think they need additional support outside of the system-wide PDs. Um, we certainly expect that that number will grow as we have brought new schools into the program. So we will continue to track that data um, each month as we go forward. So they did receive, all the teachers did receive like a system-wide PD before school started. Oh. Absolutely. So all teachers received a system-wide PD in August, and then for each of our professional development days, they've gotten that system-wide PD as well. And then, So uh, everybody has gotten something. The drop-in sessions are that additional, if you have questions, if you need some support, in addition to the system-wide PDs, um, the PDs that department chairs are turnkeying in their individual schools, and the support, everybody's also getting the support from our instructional specialists going out to different departments. Is there any way to take feedback from those additional PDs and and send those like any you know any notes that are taken or any you know tips best practices that were brought up and said distribute that to all teachers that are implementing that maybe but might be helpful to all of them? Yes, absolutely. What we are planning to do is develop kind of an FAQ of what are the common questions we've been tracking, what are the most frequently asked questions that come up in those drop-in sessions, and that we share with the department chairs and post in Schoology. So we'll continue to add to that list as we go forward. And then also for the the samples of the surveys that you showed us, will we, yes. when, when, I know it's early on, and will when you do a full update and you know, we, before we vote on it, will we get a full, like not just the sample, but the full response and the ratings of all the statements and any like additional feedback or general comments. Um, I'll defer to Dr. Kraft and maybe Dr. Didanat. I don't know what format that exactly would go to the board. Um, do you guys will? What would that look like going to the board in our final report, Dr. Kraft? You know. Did you want to start, Dr. Didanat? Or you yeah, so I I can certainly follow up with Dr. Rogers as far as the best way to you know communicate all that information. Um, I know that there was a recent request for like all survey results about. I feel like something else that we had done a uh, system-wide survey with. Um, and I'll, I will follow up with Dr. Rogers as far as the best way to make sure that the board has, you know, a full breadth of information as far as, again, sort of like survey information along the way and from the different groups, especially as we get additional feedback from students um, and from, you know, school administrators since this first round really focused on teachers. I think I just, I meant like, like a numerical value of if, if there's all everyone's getting the same question and it's you know strongly agree agree disagree strongly disagree if we could get the percentages 
of the responses, you know, who's strong, like the percentage of strongly yep. agree, you know what I mean? Okay. Like that. Yeah, sure. Um, Absolutely. And then just yeah. kind of a, you know, a total of who filled out the surveys, whether it was, you know, classroom teachers, administrators, yes. principal, that kind of thing, yes. just um, yes. a general we, overview. We will, we will definitely be able to provide that level of detail. Additionally, I wanted to add on to what Ms. Wick said. We are also um, publishing a newsletter that includes some of those tips for teachers. So we are trying multiple methods to ensure that even for those that can't come to the drop-in sessions, that we stick it in our newsletter or we share it at the department chair meeting um, or we put an update in Schoology. And so we are really trying to share those different things. And to reiterate, I know you, Ms. Wicks already answered it, but everybody was trained. So there is a base level of training that everybody has received and that we continue to give throughout our professional study days. And this is on top of that. Um, and so, you know, we will continue to advertise and continue to find different ways. And maybe if there, you know, are different times that are more popular that we will make sure we, we uh, you know, schedule those uh, more frequently. So we will continue to do our best to attract as many teachers as we can um, to continue to uh, further their understanding of how to effectively implement um, the new pilot uh, ELA curriculum. Thank you. I just have one last question, and I don't know if you're going to be able to answer it right now. Uh, I know that there was that third pilot that we was decided to get dropped. Are we have, I mean, I know it's decision based on everybody got together and made it, but um, we weren't really given the full details on that. Will we be, be getting an update on that, or can you briefly describe or tell us what happened or why you decided to drop it? So based on implementation challenges that we had from pretty much the very beginning of the school year, um, there were a lot of technology integration issues, despite the fact that on the surface, it looked like everything was, you know, going to work well. Um, the setup that needed to occur with teachers um, and several rostering issues with the vendor. Um, we were meeting with the vendor almost daily, um, some days, several times a day to try to resolve them. But when it came down to it, what was happening was teachers were spending more time trying to figure out how to use the technology to have students use the technology than to focus on the instructional content that they were teaching. Um, and truly, the, the purpose of a curriculum resource is to be an instructional tool and resource that supports learning. And when it creates challenges that are taking teachers away from the focus on that, and the focus then becomes on like, how do I make this work? Or how do I make it work for this group of students? Um, it, it loses the core purpose, which is really to have a high quality instructional material that supports teaching um, and learning of standards. Um, so that decision was made truly based on ongoing feedback from uh, both principals as well as teachers who were involved within the pilot. Um, incredible uh, visits to schools um, as well as uh, extensive work with the vendor to again try to troubleshoot that prior to that decision being made. But again, our focus must be on teaching of the standards um, and some of the challenges that we were having was not allowing us to focus there. Thank you for that explanation. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chike Kalu, do you still have a question? Yes, I just had one quick question and it was with the pilot, like are there any additional resources or just instructional adjustments that are considered within it, especially to support those students who may benefit from accommodations or just variations within it, even if they don't have like an established IEP or 504 plan or accommodation prior to that. Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. And then Dr. Kraft or Dr. Tijanato, if you want to add on. So within the, there are no external resources, right? Within the curriculum, there is the straightforward curriculum. And then every lesson, every passage, every activity is supplemented by scaffolds, different suggestions for um, different ways of teaching, different alternatives for um, choices of text that do help support all students who have a variety, right? Whether it is, as you say, a noted IEP or accommodation for um, 
uh, multilingual or multilingual learner services, or if they are simply students who need some reteaching on a certain aspect, or on a certain concept, or a certain skill or standard. All of those are embedded within the curriculum and are choices that are provided for teachers. And so that's part of that teacher development and the teacher planning in who are the students in front of them and what are the supports that they need at each step of the way, and where are they pulling those from the resources provided in the curriculum. Thank you so much. Dora, thank you for the question. Thank you. Are there any further questions from board members? Um, I just have, if it's okay, one question. Um, first of all, I really want to just compliment you on all the different ways that you're trying to share best practices through the newsletter and Schoology and with department chairs. So I do think that can go a long way to supporting the teachers as we continue the pilot. Um, my question is about the engagement. And I know that on the survey, one of the challenges was in how to engage students. And of course, engagement is really important for motivating them in terms of their reading. So were you able to get any specific information about what the issues were with engagement? And then, you know, of course, is there flexibility for teachers to use um, you know, more outside resources um, to support relevance, engagement, making it authentic for students, um, just to have a better picture of what the issues are with engagement so that we can um, improve it as we continue the pilot. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. And so we were able to get some additional information as we talk to department chairs, teachers and administrators. And um, at this point, and again, we'll see what happens as it continues. But at this point, what the main um, disconnect seems to be is really around teachers understanding about having a purchased curriculum and what are they empowered to do. And so that is the PD we are continuing to work on. Our teachers have gone from a homegrown curriculum where they kind of felt like they could do whatever they wanted, even if this is what we had, um, into here is the product that is provided. And so part of what we've done, and that's what I was sharing with those sample lesson plans, is part of what we've done is model for them here's the content. The content has to be the content. These texts have to be the text, right? But you have choices within the text of which ones to choose. Um, and the standards have to be the standards. But here are all the ways that you have options and opportunities to engage your students. So if the curriculum says, have students write a brief written response, well, you know your students better. Maybe a gallery walk would be more engaging, right? Um, and teachers have not yet quite felt free enough as they're getting to know the curriculum to make those instructional decisions. And so what our work has been and what we know we need to double down and continue to be is really showing them that the planning is still the planning, right? The materials are there for you, but your planning time should be spent in what do you know about your students, which of all of these choices would be most engaging, and which instructional strategies are best going to engage your students. So um, like I said, that's what we've embedded in those two weeks of sample lesson plans. We've had extensive PDs around what are the non-negotiables and what are the areas for the art of teaching and the mastery and what you're going to add to it so that you can engage your students. Um, in order to keep um, the integrity of the pilot, we are not encouraging teachers to bring in additional resources because then we won't be able to get accurate data across the county if we don't know, okay, you read this story, but somebody else brought in a different article that wasn't provided by the vendor. Um, but we are encouraging teachers to use the practices that they know and simply feel a little nervous to use with this new curriculum, but all the same things, right? Where are we having students get up and talk to one another? Where are we having students bring in their background knowledge and their expertise to add to that conversation? And so that's what we're finding about the engagement piece. It isn't that the texts aren't engaging. It isn't that the activities aren't engaging. It's that teachers are falling a little bit into a rote method of presentation. And so that's the support we're really working to provide. And to add on to Ms. Wick's um, answer, part of what we did with principals today is we went through a look and listen for tool. And what, what's interesting about this one that is useful for um, planning, for them supporting their teachers, is there's a column that talks about teacher actions, but there's a second column that talks about student actions. And what you will see on that side of the chart is really peers are interacting with each other, and it really talks about the student part of the lesson. Um, and I just would add that as change, sometimes change is difficult, and so as people are getting used to something 
knew, sometimes they revert to like, well, it says to do it exactly like this instead of all the wonderful things they already know to do. And so we, that is, a, uh, like Ms. Wick said, is such an important part of our professional learning to continue to remind them that they know the students sitting in front of them and that they should take from their repertoire strategies that they know to deliver the material and the content in the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Ms. Dominowski's hand is up. Yeah, I just had a follow up since um, it was brought up about um, the engagement and, and make, and it's important that our students are engaged. And you said that sometimes, you know, going back to your desk and writing, that's the engagement activity is not always what the students want, want to do. Um, it's still really important, and I want to make wanted to ask that um, while we should be giving our teachers the leniency to pick the activity that will engage our students, are we still making sure that they're leaning towards the writing activity as opposed to some other type of activity? There's a lot of research in saying that students should be writing in every subject, and I'm I'm I notice with my own kids, their handwriting. I mean, yes, they're younger, but. Um, I, I just want to make sure the focus is getting back to writing with, um, you know, pen and paper as well as just um, engaging in the computer or um, having a small group discussion or things like that. Yeah, thank so you so much for sharing that because, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. D I was just going to say one little piece. Um, because the lesson plan is so extensive, there are a variety of parts within the lesson. And so we're definitely not encouraging teachers to cut out, you know, the major writing portion of the lesson. It's actually through the body of the lesson where, okay, for, our, you know, um, let's say for our activator, instead of doing this, we could do this or this or this. But absolutely, we fully agree and support um, that the expectation is um, that students are doing rigorous reading, rigorous writing, rigorous um, interchange um, exchanges of student discourse. And so removing that would lower the rigor of the lesson. So those are not the suggestions we're giving, but certainly in the places where there is flexibility beyond just how are we demonstrating mastery of that skill overall, that's where we're encouraging teachers to use their expertise in how do we engage students into the lesson so that then they are better prepared at the end for that larger writing assignment, et cetera. Sorry, Dr. Didano. No, that's okay. So Ms. Domanowski, again, like sort of another example of like where teacher um, choice to engage students could be that, you know, um, we want students to take a stand on something, like to state an opinion based on what they read and the information they received from text from an author. And they now we want them to form an opinion. So we could do that a couple of different ways. We could have students turn and talk to each other to justify why they felt one way or another based on the text, or we could do something with everyone who believes this uh, st this view now based on what they read, go to this side of the room, and everyone who believes this based on what they read, go to this side of the room and engage in those common talks and then try to convince the people on the other side of the room of why, you know, sort of your thinking is correct based on the text. So the, the engagement is truly how does a teacher facilitate that learning opportunity, whether it is maybe you have a group of students who do really well um, working and having that discussion and that engagement in pairs, but in a, you know, but they don't like public speaking to the whole class skill we're going to work on. But it may be that we engage in certain activities in a certain way versus a different way. So it is not at all removing activities like writing and those kinds of things or um, but really it's how that activity is facilitated. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from board members? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Wicks, Dr. Kraft, for the very important update and information. Um, our next item on the agenda is math instructional updates. And for that, we have Ms. Greenberg and Ms. Machinda. Good early evening. Um, I'm here alone uh, to support uh, in Ms. Greenberg's absence. Um, and this presentation really is prepared to sort of provide some encouraging updates on mathematics um, in BCPS. So in that first slide, thank you. Um, so in this school year, what we're doing is situating our focus directly on modeling and reasoning as a way of supporting students with problem solving and making sense of mathematical ideas. And this is in alignment with the system's pathway to success. Um, and the hope is that 
this focus will strengthen the likelihood that students are able to demonstrate mastery on MCAP from grade three to algebra one, geometry and algebra two, so that they're then poised for access to success in courses beyond that in their junior and senior year. Um, what we also know is that MSDE has adopted a new college and career ready standard, which places greater emphasis on success and completion of algebra one. And so the ability for students to really demonstrate college and career readiness also positions them for access to rigorous post CCR pathway options. And um, that includes AP courses like AP statistics, AP calculus, and dual enrollment opportunities. So to this end, our focus on modeling and reasoning um, should provide students with an opportunity to engage in specific standards within the major work of the grade and this will guide our plan for targeted professional learning within these standards and site-based support. So what you'll see here is that in K2, we've selected number and operation base 10. In three through five, number and operation fraction. Six and seven, real focus on ratio and proportional reasoning. And in grade eight is the introduction of function. Uh, and those are our across the board modeling and reasoning across all of those things are some of the ways that we intend to really continue this focus. The next slide. So looking at where we are, right, we want to acknowledge in the data that for elementary, there has been incremental growth year over year, um, specifically in grade five with Hispanic and Latino students and in grade four with African-American students. However, the charge from MSDE is to show 5% improvement overall. So it's going to be important for us to have greater incremental growth for all students groups to meet this target. And ultimately, this data is indicating that we need to continue what we're doing and build on the work from the previous year uh, and ramp it up for even greater impact in the coming year. Next slide. The next slide focuses in on the secondary uh, data. And I do want to just acknowledge that in secondary, we, see, we saw incremental decrease between 22 and 23, but then an increase that surpassed where we were in 22 for 2024. Uh, and, and specifically in Algebra 1, there's been an incremental increase across all of our student groups. And what we want to do is maintain that growth so there's still important work to be done. The next slide. So what does this look like uh, for mathematics? One of the first components that we're leaning into um, and you know, trying to lift the work is through the effective intervention strategies that can happen during first instruction. So as part of our November 1st professional study day, more than uh, 2,400 elementary teachers, special educators, paraeducators explored the use of the Bridges Intervention Kit, along with research-based strategies to provide high quality responsive first instruction. In secondary, more than 300 teachers also participated in professional learning um, on November 1st, and this was focused on eliciting student thinking through the use of discourse, so where teachers were engaged in strategies that provide just-in-time feedback, coupled with moments of error analysis and uh, opportunities for student self-correction. Um, so we also redesigned mathematics engagement for multilingual learners with interrupted education to ensure that there was an intentional scaffold toward access and success in Algebra 1 while remaining on cohort and with their age alike peers. The next slide. New initiatives that have been in play this year um, include the funding that supplied every elementary building with a uh, mathematics lead um, through uh, the operating budget and a TSI grant. And this opportunity um, we're leveraging by providing targeted professional learning to this particular resource. So to date, we've had two professional learnings for each of these groups, the Title I math coaches and the um, lead specialists. And Focusing on coaching centered for students for the Title I and specific content development for the specialist, we've had over 90% attendance. Uh, and so we're really excited about the kind of learning that they're able to take back into each of the buildings. Um, in the secondary space, we've shifted the middle school schedule and it provides for math every day in grade six. And this allows for time for additional intervention and supports that could solidify the foundational knowledge that students need to transfer with them from grade 
to grade as they um, go toward becoming college and career ready. Uh, we also have an assessments pilot in the works that will happen at nine middle schools, where in grade six, they'll engage with additional opportunities for formative assessment, real-time feedback through assessments. And we're working towards a Conmigo AI tutor pilot in 12 middle schools at grade eight, which will provide students with immediate feedback through the use of an AI tutor um, and Khan Academy um, content and activities. Uh, we also have a tutoring program pilot that's in partnership with UMBC at Woodlawn Middle School. Uh, they are working with grade eight and algebra one students, grade eight students who are in grade eight and or algebra one. We're currently including 26 college tutors from UMBC and serving 86 students. So what this means is in a student to tutor ratio, we have a three to one and in some cases two to one student to tutor ratio. So they're getting really independent, individual, personalized support and developing trust-filled relationships with a college tutor where they're feeling more comfortable with growth and their, their opportunity to make mistakes and make uh, corrections. Uh, across elementary and secondary together, though, we are leveraging the work of high-functioning PLCs by pushing into schools and supporting teacher planning and data analysis through our central office specialist. On the next um, slide. So then as we continue to leverage the high quality curriculum that we have, the targeted professional learning that we are centering on the major work of the grade across grades and um, a new focus on modeling and reasoning, having students to make sense of mathematical problems, which is highly measured um, on the MCAP. Our long range plan is just to continue with these ongoing touch points using our central office staff and job embedded capacity building as every school has a central office specialist connected that will go out into the schools and work with teachers and teacher teams and uh, building leadership on um, impacting student outcomes. We're also continuing with ongoing professional learning for principals. We had our per principal leadership development today. Um, with assistant principals and other teachers and support staff in uh, other departments. So our ELD teachers and support staff and our special education teachers and support staff. And final slide, getting our stakeholders involved. So we've engaged in two curriculum nights where we have shared with parents what the curriculum um, for bridges and illustrative mathematics looks like, along with supports that they have both within the curriculum and provided by uh, BCPS for family resources that guide unit by unit ways to engage with families, with your students. Uh, we also have our homework helpers, which is a video library. So homework helpers is no longer live, but we have a video library um, that's accessible through YouTube at every grade with assignments from each unit of study where you will see our homework helper and uh, instru instructional specialist, Joe Tang, going through homework assignments. Parents can watch, students can watch um, and engage uh, from home. So these are some of the ways that we're trying to connect with families on the different ways that they can support their students in engaging in this sort of modeling and reasoning and sense making in mathematics. And finally, um, if there are any questions, I am excited to answer. Thank you, Ms. Machinda. Are there board members with questions or comments? Ms. Dominowski? Sorry, I keep going first. If anybody else wants to go first, um, it's fine. Uh, I just, if you could go back to slides three and four, for those data, the MCAP data from, I guess, 22 to 23 and 23 to 24, are those um, was illustrative and uh, Bridges math used in both those, um, those school years? Yes. So we are in, um, I, I think we are in our fifth year of Bridges and our fourth year of illustrative mathematics. So those were both in play during the the data that was collected from the 22 and 23 school years, just at different levels. So and because we also rolled in that curriculum grade level by grade level. So, for instance, Algebra 2 did not have 
uh, and there's no data point there for Algebra 2, but to give an example, um, did not have illustrative mathematics in 2022, right? Um, so that might have been geometry. Certainly our students in elementary who were advanced and accelerated were using it. And then we did 6, 7, 8, and Algebra 1 in the next year. So you will see the impact of that, but for different grade levels as the years progress. Last year, everyone had algebra, um, everyone had illustrative mathematics and bridges um, as their curriculum. So I'm just looking at this, and I, I know it's, it's uh, I guess it's still relatively early, um, but it's pretty low as far as proficiency wise, I mean, uh, for especially for our seventh graders and our eighth grade eighth graders. And I'm looking at these suggestions that you're giving us, you know, the AI tutor working with um, Baltimore County uh, UMBC tutoring pipeline. Uh, so the AI pilot, what are the what is the research and the study behind that? Do we have any data on that on its success rates? Um, I'm just I'm curious about how an AI math tutor is, is going to be implemented or how it works. Yeah, so that, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Ms. Michelle, you go ahead. No, <laughs> it hasn't. So the the con a con amigo is what it's called um, has not actually rolled out. We are working towards getting all of those um, all those things dotted and crossed for contract and digital access. Uh, but the way that it works is that a student would complete an assignment with the opportunity to get in time feedback. So I, I'll play it out in a classroom where a teacher is trying to address every student as they're working individually and go and give personalized and individualized feedback as students are working through problems. That's a challenge. Um, and specifically, if the student is, if the teacher has to watch a student do the thinking through and then catch them right at the time or the moment of error and give feedback for this Khan Academy, they'll engage in their illustrative mathematics activity and have a, a an AI tutor right there available for a question. So it's it's almost like having immediate and very appropriate feedback from 30 teachers in a room with 30 students who have that many, but you know, that many teachers in a room with all the students versus one teacher trying to catch each student as they're thinking through. It also provides students with an opportunity to be vulnerable. If they don't want to ask a question out loud or they don't want to raise their hand in class, that conmigo is there to provide them with some question um, feedback and some scaffold and guidance as they're engaging in whatever the problem is. But we have not used it in the system yet. It is coming on board. I, I want to say, and Dr. D Dr. Di Donato can come on in with this. That we'd like to try to make sure that it's available beginning in the spring. So, so my Ms. question is: It's actually a pilot that's being run through MSDE, and MSDE reached out to BCPS as well as two other LEAs um, to identify to to pilot it. So it is. Um, something that they're exploring um, and we're participating in the pilot as part of, you know, our collaborative work with the state department. And also knowing that, you know, we are looking at ways to provide additional support for our students. Um, so this is being done um, at it's no cost to BCPS. Um, and it is it is another resource and tool. And so as Ms. Machinda was saying, um, part of the tutoring Tutoring part is um, students can verbally ask um, questions. They can, uh, there's a text to speech feature. So it provides accommodations and accessibility with regards to students asking questions. They can type in a chat. It provides modeling. It will clarify questions um, for them. So, um, you know, again, we will be out visiting the schools that are going to be piloting it um, when we we begin that implementation part of it. Um, but from our preliminary work with um, MSDE as well as the vendor, um, we've gone through some different pilots, uh, training components, sort of like the sandbox demo sites of what it would look like. Um, also, uh, Khan Academy is linked with NWEA, so for which um, is the map. Uh, assessment and part of MAP, it has something called growth um, pathways. And on these growth pathways, based on how a student performs on MAP, they can provide specific targeted practice based on the skills that a student might have struggled with on MAP. So another feature that this does offer is so for that independent practice or 
extra practice on a skill based on the math assessment, the teacher could say, okay, you know, student A requires some more practice on this based on map. Um, it would do a tutorial with the student. It then provides that practice and gives that responsive feedback to the student. Um, and the teacher can look at the work that the student's done. So it provides a couple of different pathways um, for us to provide some extra support. It absolutely does not replace a human teacher in a classroom, but it does provide another opportunity for students to have feedback in a different way. So my questions with that, I mean, I guess, will are we going to see this? Or is it going to be presented to us as a pilot? Or Because or, I'm curious as to how, like with math, a lot of times it's not just the answer, but how you got to the answer. And I don't know how an AI can see how a child is writing down you know, their work on a piece of paper doesn't really necessarily correlate to typing into the computer. So how, like that, that's a lot of, I mean, even working with, you know, your own kids who just, they, they try to talk to a, talk you through a problem. It's kind of hard to understand it unless you look at what they've actually done. Like, oh, I see what you did here. You may need to move this one over to this column. How is an AI going to be able to do that? So let me talk with um, Ms. Machina. Maybe we can follow up with, um, Khan Academy to see if we can get and share one of those video snippets from Comingo to mm -hmm. provide that that visual of sort of the interactiveness of it. Okay, that would be great. I'm just sure. I, I'm more worried about you know I, it sounds like something that would be great for you know maybe our our students that are a little bit more advanced in math and could use an extra help, but like not the just to keep going forward. But as far as like our students that are behind. I think that they value that one-on-one -on -one with a teacher that is over their shoulder showing that, I mean, that's kind yes, of. Yes, absolutely. It does not replace a teacher by any stretch of the means, but it does, sort of, it, you know, again, the purpose is to, to provide another avenue to support some students in part of a pilot. And, you know, part of, I guess, what MSD is also looking at with regards to AI is what is the, the efficacy of it? It doesn't mean that students who are using it would have any less interaction with a teacher. That absolutely wouldn't be the case. But I think, again, as, um, you know, as the world continues to look at, at AI. The, the state is also um, looking at how it might be able to be leveraged to support students. So this is, again, just an opportunity for us to look at it and explore that, you know, firsthand ourselves to see does it does it help our students or, or is it not so helpful? And this is a great chance for us to really see that. So absolutely, teachers are first and foremost the, the best thing for our students, um, especially to clarify misconceptions and to ensure um, they're learning, uh, especially with challenging concepts. Yeah, I just, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, belittle this in any way. It just seems like a lot of the ways of reinforcing it was, you know, going to video libraries, this AI, um, except for the, and there are other tutor programs that are not just UB, UMBC. There's a lot of um, high school tutoring programs that uh, you can get affiliated with and students can get bussed around. I know uh, the city schools do that. But um, it, that human contact, that person there helping you is, uh, I just, I don't, I don't want to, I see us going further away right now as, you know, implementing with the Chromebooks and a lot of technology getting forced more and more into our schools and we're not really seeing the progress, you know, with the data. So I, that's why I get wary whenever we say we're going to, you know, pilot this new technology, AI, whether it be video or something like that, because so far we haven't seen a ton of upwards data points when it comes to incorporating more and more technology. Thank you. Um, are there any comments or questions um, from board members? OK, um, seeing none, we will move to our last agenda item. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next curriculum committee meeting will be held on December 5th, 2024. I want to thank all of the presenters today that provided really important information um, for us as we move forward. And thank you for your time. Is there any further business? Um, Ms. Zaleski, at the previous curriculum committee meeting, um, Mr. Manowski had asked a question with regards to um, seeing the sample parent report for Amira. Um, we did want to share that, that that is available to everybody um, uh, 
we had some website updates and we want to make sure all of our links were working, um, but it is available to everybody on the BCPS website. So if you go to the main BCPS website and you uh, search elementary ELA in the little search box um, and then click on the ready to read act tab, it'll uh, take you right there. You can see um, an overview description of Amira as well as Dibbles, um, get information about the Ready to Read Act, and underneath it there's sample letters um, in various languages for both um, what the parent report is uh, for both Amira and Dibbles. So we just wanted to bring that back to uh, close that loop because I know that um, that was a request as far as uh, to see one of those, uh, the parent documents. Thank you. Thank you for that update and thank you for providing it in multiple languages. That's terrific. No um, is, is there any other further business? Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Good night, everybody.